and then also an essay. So. <laughs> Thanks to the, the job of Kemet Latin. Okay, so now we start uh, our first talk of the day, actually lecture of the day. Which is making a series of talks on random map intuition and the use of linear Dyson equation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Does it work? No. Yes. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? No. <laughs> can, you hear, can you hear me? Yes? No. <laughs> okay. Like this? No? Can you hear me? Okay, what if you come closer to me? <laughs> I'm going to give a, a blackboard talk. Um, anyway, so can you hear me? It's okay now? I, mean, uh, I have the feeling it doesn't work. It's not working. Do you want me to take the... It's working? You to speak a little bit lower. Lo Is it working? Yes, okay. Okay, if you can't hear me, then uh, raise your arm on the... <laughs> okay, it's desperate. <laughs> okay, I will try to, uh, to speak louder. Uh, okay, so my, um, I would like first to thank Tamara Grava for putting all this work and organizing this event, making it possible. And um, so my, uh, my course will be about Dyson Twinger equation and random matrices. So the, the point is that uh, random matrices provide a great example of complicated system where uh, the eigenvalues are in very strong interactions. And uh, somehow there was a, um, a need to, to get new tools to study them. And Dyson Troiger equations are one of them. Okay? And uh, this is one, um, one tool which, is, uh, which I hope to convince you is very useful. And today I will show you how it works, how you can use this equation, this set of equations to analyze so the so-called Gaussian ensembles. Okay, so the GUE. The GUE matrix. Okay, so this, will, this is some of the simplest example of, uh, that we can consider. And the GUE matrix is just a matrix which is uh, emission with uh, IID on independent entries. Entries above the diagonal, so X and IJ are independent. And they are Gaussian, so they are complex in the case of the GUE. So this is a, a Gaussian complex. Okay, so you have with variance 1 over N. So if I is smaller than J. And so you can think about that as the sum of uh, two independent Gaussian. And they're uh, real complex, uh, they're real Gaussian, uh, with covariance one over uh, n on the diagonal. Okay, so that's, a, that's a basic example of random matrices we'd like to study. And um, what you would like to understand is the spectrum of this kind of matrices. And what is nice with the GUE ensemble is that you have a, an explicit joint law. So if you would let lambda 1, lambda n be the eigenvalues, then uh, you can see that the distribution is quite explicit and is given by what is called the Coulomb gas law. Sum of a lambda i square. And here you have some normalization. Okay, so this, uh, if, if you would have chosen a real entries here instead of complex, 
uh, you would uh, get the same type of, uh, um, of expression, but you would have to multiply to replace here the exponent 2 by beta, and here beta over 4. So beta equal 1 if the entries are real. and two otherwise. Okay, but the point is that this kind of distribution is uh, quite complicated to study, typically because you have an interaction which is very strong, which is given by this Coulomb gas law. And this Coulomb gas actually is also interesting on its own and can be generalized to higher dimension, for instance, by taking uh, complex uh, numbers here uh, and what we would like to find is uh, how to, what, we, what I want to show you is how to uh, analyze this kind of uh, distribution by using the dyson schwinger equations. Okay, the type of question I will address here is uh, mainly about macroscopic asymptotics. So what we would like to show is that there is a convergence uh, of the distribution of the eigenvalues. So if you take test function f, then you show that this is going to converge. So this is one of the goal. And this is going to converge almost surely. And then the next question is uh, about the fluctuations. So if you remove the limit, So can you show that this converges in distribution toward some uh, Gaussian distribution? Okay, so yes. So n is going to infinity. So it's for this uh, distribution, under this distribution. So usually you, what you do is you use borel cantelli lemma to show almost show convergence. So this means that somehow you, of course, the, you, I'm not going to construct for you the sequence which is going to converge almost surely, but you have from borel cantelli lemma a canonical way to extend your probability measure so that it's, you give sense to almost show convergence. So that's really the... The, the meaning of, uh, of the convergence. Okay, so, so that's the goal. And, uh, to, and uh, the point is that, it's, as I said, it's not easy to prove this kind of theorem because you have this strong interaction. And so Kurt Johansson, I think, was the first uh, to use, so I think it's 97, uh, use the dyson schwinger equation to uh, prove this kind of convergence, well, in a slightly, uh, in a more general context, where here instead of lambda square, you have a potential. So this is what is called matrix models. Uh, And um, what I want to show you today is how to use uh, for the GUE. And uh, what I will do in the next uh, lecture is first to show you how to, show it, to prove it for matrix model in a perturbative uh, uh, situations. <laughs> So this is a matrix model. It's typically this kind of model, but where you have replaced the lambda square by a more general potential. Uh, then, uh, and eventually, this can be several matrices. And then uh, I will uh, show you how to, so there, there, in this situation, there are two settings which are quite different, which is the so-called one cut a situation 
where uh, the limiting measure E of f, so this, you have to think this is replaced by, eventually by v. So sigma will depend on v. Okay, and this, uh, this means that v of x is something like epsilon x squared plus some perturbation, uh, x squared plus some perturbation. Okay, so you are not far from the case of the GUE. So in this case, so you have the one cut situ uh, Okay, so this is a perturbative situation, and then you have the non-perturbative situation. Okay, well, uh, so you take a general V. Okay, and then uh, in this case, you have two types of difficulty. The case where the limiting measure here that we will show to exist, so sigma is some sigma of V, has connected support. And the case where it's disconnected. So this is a several cut. Okay, and the last thing I will, uh, I will, uh, I will uh, discuss in this class is the extension to disc discrete tiling, to discrete setting, to discrete measures. and a random tiling. Okay, so that's somehow the plan of what I want to, to discuss here. Um, there are the lecture notes, and uh, I will uh, do, uh, I will not always do all the details, but I will try to, um, to give you at least the main ideas. And of course, you should not hesitate to stop me if you don't understand, because my understanding is that there are people from diff very different uh, backgrounds, so you should really uh, uh, feel comfortable to ask questions. Okay, so that's somehow what you want to do, is to understand this kind of uh, questions. And to do that, as I said, we will use these dyson Schrödinger equations. Okay, and the idea that we will, so we will get equations uh, for this type of observables under this type of distribution. And we will then solve this equation to eventually um, prove this kind of theorem. So <clears throat> let, me, uh, let me tell you more precisely the, the result we want to prove for the GUE. So what I want to prove for the GUE is uh, the following thing, so the expectation of one over n, the trace of xn to the k. I want to show that this is, I can expand it as a, as a function of the dimension. <coughs> and uh, what I want to prove is uh, that uh, if I look Uh, at any um, family of uh, moments, okay, where k i are some integer numbers, uh, then this will converge towards a Gaussian. joint, so P, uh, joint uh, Gaussian variables uh, with uh, so covariance, which is, which I will denote C, K, I, K, J. 
Okay, so this is what I'm going to, to prove for you. And uh, this, uh, this will uh, give me the, this, uh, this will answer this question, at least for functions which are polynomial. Okay, here, so MGK is uh, the number of, uh, uh, so graphs uh, that, uh, so it's, let's say, maps of genius G uh, built over a vertex of degree K. So what is a map? It's a, it's a graph, a connected graph that uh, you can draw, you can properly embed onto a surface. And what I say that the minimal uh, genus of such a surface has to be G. So you can do a, a drawing. So here I have a, a vertex of, uh, with K uh, of degree K. So K is equal to six. And then you, you count the number of ways to match the half edges so that you can draw uh, this, your surface onto a a surface of genus G. So here you see that this is uh, genus zero. You can draw this on the plane. But of course, uh, for instance, if I do this, you will get uh, genus one. Okay. And uh, CKL, so the covariance of the Gaussian process, is going to be uh, the number of planar maps. So this means the genus is zero. Uh, built over uh, a vertex of degree K and one of degree L. Okay, so that's what we want to prove. So here you have to be careful that when you do the counting, you can think about the, the half edges here as labeled because you have drawn them on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the surface and you have actually here I rooted, I should have wrote rooted maps. Okay, and so, uh, so this gives you a full, ex, uh, a full expression for this. This is the so-called arrer zage formula. And you can uh, reconcile this, uh, this with this question I, I asked at the beginning. By the following exercise, which is that if you look at the M0 of K, it's going to be the integral of X K under the semicircular law. Um, okay, so where sigma is the square root of four minus x square dx one over uh, pi. Okay, so why, um, oops, nobody said anything, but uh, this should have gone to zero with this normalization. You should not uh, renormalize, get something non-trivial. So you can, uh, you can show that this, uh, this is true. And so what this implies uh, for the, this results, let me call this theorem. So what this uh, theorem imp implies is 
that the expectation of the integral of 1 over n, the sum of f lambda i, this converges to the integral of f of x d sigma of x. OK, if you take f to be a polynomial, All right. So by density of polynomial function in the set of continuous function, you can extend this to uh, continuous function. So here, this is only uh, L1 convergence. Okay. But, uh, but you can see, uh, in fact, that you can get almost your convergence by uh, estimating by estimating the covariance, okay, as we said, by, to use borel cantelli lemma. And so you can use this. So this implies uh, the second point. So this implies that 1 over n, the trace minus its expectation Well, so this is finite. This is going to be smaller than some CK over N square, okay, because this converges towards a Gaussian variable once I have multiplied by N. And so by borel cantelli lemma, so this implies that this goes. to zero almost surely. All right. So and then you can also extend this to a continuous function. So this proves this. And then uh, if you look at the second question, well, this is a, if you just take any polynomial function, you just have to sum one of these, OK? And uh, so the second point, Maybe I should write this A and B. So B implies that the trace of any polynomial function so this converges towards some uh, Gaussian variable with some convariance which depends on P. Surely I should have said that this is centered. In fact, if you look at uh, GOE matrices, so if you take the real entries, you will not get something which is centered. But okay, when you take GOE matrices, uh, you get a centered Gaussian process. Okay, so is there any question, or can I go to the proof of this kind of thing by using the Eisentringer equation? Yes. Here. Yeah, OK. So, um, so the, the surface is, so you can see that here, well, yeah, it's, uh, I'm very bad in drawing. So you should add that to somebody doing geometry. But, <laughs> OK, so, so you can think about here that somehow I can uh, draw this vertex on this surface. And when I do that, it's properly embedded in the sense that the edges do not cross anymore. Clearly, when I embed it on the plane, I have a, it's not properly embedded because the, the edges are going to cross. But so the point is that here, your graphs, you can always draw them on a surface in such a way that the edges do not cross. So of course, and th then of course you could imagine that you are going to draw them in a much more complicated surface, eventually with some, uh, something like this. But this would be stupid because, I mean, you have no reason to do that. So the genus of the graph is really the minimal genus 
of the surface on which you can draw it. Okay, so you don't, should not do that. Um, yes, so this is the Catalan numbers. Uh, I do not remember the formula. I'm sure that lots of people do here, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can, uh, you can compute the genus by saying that 2 minus 2j is, so let's see, number, so I have to remember, number of vertices, so here there is only one. So here there are two, but uh, uh, plus number of faces minus number of edges. So exactly, so you can compute the genus in, by this formula. So here you have only one vertex, the number of faces of the part the number of parts that you, uh, if you, if you look at this uh, embedding, for instance, when you cut along the edges, you will get faces. And uh, the number of edges, so here you, have a, you had six half edges, but after the matching, you have only two, three edges. You can compute the... Yeah, so, so the, the CKL is a, uh, so maybe I can take this room again. So, so you have, let's say, two uh, vertices. Actually, I could al also take even here. But they need, the total number needs to be paired so that it's non-zero. And so I have the, the labeled, this labeled of edges, and then I am going to match them so that I get a connected graph. So for instance, I have this. I don't know. Something like this. Yeah. And so this has to be planar to contribute to this number. So I'm counting that all these possible matching so that the result is planar. Okay. Okay, so now let me, uh, let me discuss how to prove that. So the, the, the original way that uh, was used was simply to express all this as, uh, in terms of the Gaussian variables of the entries, just by using the formula of the trace. And you could also do that here and compute the moments. Uh, and um, compute, the, actually, yeah, the idea will be to compute the moments of this guy and so it converges to the moment of this guy. And again, if you have convergence in moments, it implies convergence in law, okay? Because the, the limit is a Gaussian variable. So, so you could do all this by just expanding everything in terms of the entries. But uh, as I said, I want to generalize uh, uh, this strategy to a more complicated system, and then uh, there is no a priori uh, definition in terms of independent entries. So I will show you how to prove this by using dyson tringer equation. Okay, so first I have to say what, is dyson what are the dyson tringer equation in this case. dyson tringer equation. Okay, so, so the lemma is that one, so if I look at my moments, so I will define uh, this as M and K, then uh, this will be the expectation of the sum L equal zero to K minus two of 1 over n, the trace of x n l, 1 over n, trace of x n, k minus l minus 2. So that's the first one, and the more general one is that, so if I set, I will set 
y n of l to be the trace of x n l minus its expectation. Uh, then, if I look at the expectation of the trace of x n k1 times the product of y k i, i equal 2 to p. So of course, I will not have the room to write it. Uh, okay. So this will be the expectation of, yeah, I should, uh, yeah. Let me go over there. Because otherwise, you will not be able to read it. So the expectation of base of x and k1 pi of equal ki. So these are any kind of choice of integers, so this will be the expectation of, so the sum L equals zero to K minus two, one over N the trace X N L, one over N the trace X N K minus L minus two, times the product of the Y K I, plus uh, the sum from I equal two to P of the expectation of one over N, the trace Xn K1 plus, uh, ah, K1 plus uh, Ki minus two, times the product of G different from I of Y uh, Kj. Okay, so, so what are these equations? So that's it. These are equations. So I have two sets of equations, which are equation on the product of the expectation of moments. Okay, my observables are this trace of x to the k. And what I'm giving you with these equations is some, uh, some equation on only these observables, the expectation of these observables. So the point which makes uh, the GUE much easier than any other system is that you can see that that's somehow um, a recursive equation in this case, because if I look at the total degree in the xn, here I have the total degree which is some ki. Uh, yes. And here I have lower degree. If I look at the total degree, if I sum all the degree, I have the sum of ki minus two on here as well. So you see actually it's an inductive, it's an equation which is inductive on the expectation of the moment. And so in fact, it defines uniquely all these moments just because it's inductive. So it's very natural that I am able to analyze it at the end to show you this type of result. Okay. Uh, however, again, what I'm going to do now is to show you how to analyze it asymptotically because this is somehow the way I will proceed in other more complicated situations. So first the proof, maybe of this uh, dyson Schrödinger equation, so it's integration by parts. And, and for, to do that, you just have to notice that uh, when you have GUE entries. So if you want to do integration by part, so if you take the entry IJ, so, yeah, so the expectation, and you take any kind of function of uh, the other entries, all the entries, Okay, so you have to remember that this xij is a complex Gaussian with covariance 1 over n. 
So you do integration bypass, and what you find is that this is going to be the derivative of f with respect to, and this is where you have to be careful, xji. Okay, so if you have a complex, uh, just one real Gaussian variable, it's well known that uh, Gaussian variables are characterized uh, with, by integ the integration by part formula. Okay, so that's the usual thing. Here you just have to be careful that here you have gi and here you have ij because, um, because just it's complex. Okay, and it, when it's real, it's just, uh, it's still true because it's ij and, and gi. So you just have a, a, a factor one over two coming because I took, I uh, know, oh actually you don't have a factor one over two in this case. Okay, so um, that's the formula of integration by path. So how can I use it uh, to prove, for instance, uh, well, I can prove directly maybe this formula. So I want to uh, get an equation for this guy. So what I just do is that, yeah. Okay, so I take a function f, uh, which is smooth, and uh, with uh, yeah, infinite support. Yeah, I mean, uh, any, any kind of smooth function. I mean, if, if you don't like it written like this, you just should think about uh, the fact that so this, because here you have the derivative of this guy minus the derivative of this guy, this is going to be f prime x just by integration by parts, and the, so the, the part that you are maybe uh, worried about is just this one. Okay, and when you go from minus infinity to plus infinity, it's just zero. So it's just this, this written in terms of the entries of, uh, okay? So that's important because actually we will do a lot of integration by parts. So, so now if I want to apply it to, to get a formula for this, what I do is that I just write that this is sum over the ij of xij, and then I have xa k minus one gi, okay? Product of the yKl. And now I am going to do integration by parts uh, with respect to this guy. So what I get is what the sum, so I put the sum outside. Uh, I will have the one over n and the expectation of the derivative with respect to xgi of xn k minus one gi, the product of the y kl. Okay, so now to, to conclude, I, I, I need to, to compute these uh, derivatives. Or maybe I should keep that. Okay, so it's not very complicated to compute this derivative because uh, you just have, you're just dealing with, uh, with uh, polynomials in your uh, random variable. So if you, if you have something like this, I know it's not a good choice of, uh, okay, if you try to, to differentiate something like this, what you will get is just the sum uh, over, uh, the, the, the place in the, the polynomial that you will differentiate, so it will be xn uh, m, so s uh, j, s l minus m minus one, i uh, t, and the thumb, yeah, 
the sum of the possible m from 0 to l minus 1. Okay, so if you use that to compute this, uh, this the, the derivative of this guy on the derivative of this guy, what you see is that the derivative, so if you apply this to, uh, so it's uh, gi, so this will be the sum of xn m, uh, gg xn l minus m minus 1 ii. And when you differentiate this guy, so l, so what you will get is uh, the sum of, uh, uh, so you have to think that you're taking the, the sum of the derivative of x, so maybe I should write it. Okay, so this is just a trace. Okay, so you use this formula. The sum over M and the sum over S. And then you can make the summation over S and what you get is just L, X, L minus one, and I, J. Okay. And so when you put these two formula uh, inside here, okay, you get exactly uh, this formula. This term is coming from the differential of X, L, and G, G, I, because you are going to sum over G and I. And this term is going to come from this derivative because you have to uh, remember that you are multiplying by this guy, xn k minus 1 gi. Okay? So that's uh, just differential. And actually, uh, as a, another interesting uh, thing is to do this when you have several different random matrices independent and you take instead of xl x to the L words in these several matrices, and you can do exactly the same kind of computation in this case. So the several matrix case is exactly the same. Okay, so now I have still uh, 20 minutes, so I want to show you how to uh, analyze this equation. Everybody understood the derivation, it's okay? And uh, so how do you uh, analyze this, uh, these equations? Well, the first thing is, uh, is to see that, as I said, this, in this case, the dyson schwinger equation gives you really uh, an equation with a unique solution. So in particular, you can derive two uh, a priori estimates, which, is, which are crucial, which is first the concentration of the lemma is that for all k, uh, there exist CK and DK finite, such that independently, independent of N, such that you can bond your moments and you can also bond the covariance. And so that's, uh, uh, ah, sorry, concentration and compactness somehow. So this is somehow the compactness. And this is a concentration of measure because it shows you that the trace is very close from its expectation in moments. And so the proof is very easy, so it's just by induction. Over, so k and the sum of the ki. So how do you do that? You, you look first at the case where uh, this is 0 or 1. So in, if it's 0 or 1, it's very easy because uh, you get 0. Okay. 
some k i equals zero, one, c k is equal to d k equal, well, actually, c zero, c zero is one, c one is uh, zero, and uh, d zero, well, d zero is d one is zero. Okay, and then you assume you have shown this bond uh, at, uh, for k on the sum of ki smaller than k, and you put it back in your equations. Okay, and so what you see that this, you can recenter it, so what you get is a covariance. Okay, so maybe I can show that. So you get from uh, one, that mn of k. So you recenter, so it will be the sum from L equals zero to k minus two of mn L, mn k minus L minus two, plus, or oh here you can, the expectation of y L, y k, minus L minus two. Okay, and again, what you see that you are doing the induction on the sum of the coefficients. So here you are reducing them from by two. So if you, if you have proven these estimates previously, you see that this is smaller than D K minus two, and this is also going to be smaller than the sum of the C L C K minus L minus two. So it's going to be bonded. So, by induction, M and K is uh, bonded, so it's smaller than the sum. I can put that C L C K minus L minus two plus uh, D K minus two times K minus two, which I to be CK. And uh, similarly for, for the expectation of the YL, because I have this formula, I recenter it by the expectation. I can show it. So the expectation of P of YKI. So this is going to be this guy. Uh, times the product of the YKI minus the expect its expectation. So minus the expectation of the sum of one over n trace x n l trace of x n k minus l minus two times the expectation of the product uh, plus the extra term, which is a sum from i equal to to uh, p of the expectation of one over n the trace of Xn k1 plus ki minus two times this product. Okay, and now you just write in, in this right hand side that the trace of xk is just yk plus uh, m m and k, and you can see that the right hand side will only depends on quantities uh, that you already bonded. Okay. So by induction, you can show that this is also going to be bonded. All right, so that's good. So in the next example, I will discuss, it will never be possible to deduce from the dyson schwinger equation this kind of bond, but we will have other tools to do it. But once we have the dyson schwinger these bonds, the idea is that we can uh, analyze asymptotically the equations. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, if I come back here, for instance, once I have this uniform bond on this moment, 
I know this is going to be small. So I know asymptotically that uh, I will have, okay, so I have no more blackboards. It's terrible. Uh, okay. So I know asymptotically that I will have an equation for Mn. Okay, so I have MNK, which is the sum of MNL, MNK minus L minus 2, plus something which is of order 1 over N square. So now I can prove by, uh, by induction that this is going to converge. I know that MN0 is equal to 1, MN1 is equal to 0, and by induction, MNK is going to converge to MK, which is solution of MK, which is the sum of ML, MK minus L minus 2. Okay, and there exists a unique solution. So that's the point also, is that the, you have a unique solution. And uh, now, if you want, you can find out that this, this is this number of planar maps because this satisfies the same induction relation. So this is so M0K. Uh, and the way you can see that this M0K satisfies the same induction relation is by looking at your uh, description of M0K. Okay, and you see you want to count the number of possible matching so that this is drawn on the, on the sphere. And so what you do is that you look at the place where this will be matched. Okay, and, and then what you see is that when, once you have matched the root, you obtain two planar maps. And this time with a, a vertex of degree which is here L, and here, so it's the remaining vertices, which is M, so K minus L minus 2. So M0K has to be the sum of M0 L, M0 K minus L minus 2. Okay, so this is just to say that this limiting equation has a unique solution. And because it's, and it is also an equation which is satisfied by this number M0 L. Okay, now we can, uh, we can do the same thing for the covariance, for instance. Okay, so for the covariance, so here I started to write uh, the equation, so I have the expectation of yk, yl, which is the expectation of 1 over n to the sum. I think I put an extra 1 over n, sorry, again. It's going to be the sum of the trace of x to the uh, m, trace of x, k minus m, minus 2, yl, uh, minus, so the expectation, so the product of the expectation of this times the expectation of this, but which is 0 in this case, okay, because yl is centered, and uh, plus uh, the expectation of uh, the 1 over n, the trace of x k plus l minus 2. Okay, and then uh, what you do is that you recenter these guys to get just something which depends on yl, on m. So what you get is a sum of mn uh, m, mn k minus m minus 2 times, well, this expectation, so this is 0. And then the expectation of, so we'll have mn m 
times the covariance of this guy, k minus m minus 2, yl, and then mn uh, k minus m minus 2, the expectation of ym yl, and plus at the end, oh, and here I forgot uh, l plus l over n mn k plus l uh, minus 2. Okay, so here I think I forgot something, so it's uh, Let's see, trace. Uh, so this is zero, okay. This is zero because this is centered. And uh, here what I see that I have the covariance, but again with a, a smaller uh, exponent, here as well. And so I can see that by induction, I can again show the convergence. And, uh, and what we get, What we get is that the expectation of yk, yl will converge to some quantity, which is ckl, which satisfies the equation that this, so this term and this term are actually the same, because you sum, so it will be m, uh, m, oh no, it's not very nice, s, the covariance of uh, k, minus s minus 2 and l plus l m k plus l minus 2. Okay, so it's the same thing. And now again, you can play the same game and see that the number of ma planar maps that you can build over two vertices uh, of degree k and l will satisfy this very same equation. So here again, when k plus l is 0 or 1, you just get 0. OK, so, so that's, uh, that, that's and, and now you can continue. So maybe I think my, my time is more or less uh, complete. I oh, know I still have five minutes. So you can continue, for instance, for uh, if you want to compute m and k minus uh, its limit, okay, and then maybe I'm not going to do it, but imagine you want to do that. Well, you, you suppressed mk here, and then you're going to uh, subtract also the limit. You recenter with respect to the limit, and again, by induction, you prove that this difference, once you normalize it by n square, which is the size of this uh, error term, will converge towards some induction relation. And this induction relation will be just the induction relation which is also satisfied by maps, which this time are of genus one. And now you can continue like this. I mean, it's done in the notes uh, to show that if you look at the general uh, polynomials in the YK, they will converge towards uh, the moments for the Gaussian variables. Okay, so. I think you got the idea. I mean, it's just a bit painful to do, to do all this computation on the blackboard. But uh, what I wanted to show you that, because it's very easy in this case, it's just induction. And still, it uh, allows you to get uh, quite nice results in terms of enumeration of maps and why the topological recursion appear in this context. So, so the, the topological reg uh, recursion are, in a very basic form, this type of uh, of induction relation where you see um, genus enumeration of all maps of any genus driven by this kind of equations. And uh, so next time I want to show you how the very same ideas are generalized to much more complicated uh, questions. And namely, so next time I think I will do a perturbative cases where you don't have Gaussian uh, matrices, but you have something which is not too far. Well, we can use the same kind of ideas. Thank you very much.